And hey everyone, it's Vlad Blagovic here and welcome back to the Full Funnel B2B Marketing Show. And today's guest is Michael Jack, who is the Chief Revenue Officer of Datadobe. Now, there's two interesting things about Datadobe. First one is that they've basically introduced a completely new product category. And the second one is that they're a European company but they're doing most of their business in the US. I'm really looking forward to chatting about these topics. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Vlad. Glad to be here. Awesome. So let's dive in. You spent the last 18 years creating a new market category with your team, and you did it, which I find really impressive, without any external funding. Now, this is probably one of the most difficult strategies to execute, and it's probably one of the most risky ones. What made you decide to do it? Um, I don't think it was really a decision uh, as such as uh, we, when we started the company back in 2010, um, there was the four founders just really wanted to start a company together, right? And we didn't have, you know, a very specific idea of what we were going to do back then. But things fell into place as they often do in, in business, which is great if you're, if you're keeping an eye out. And it just so happened that uh, we were experts in a particular uh, data storage platform and uh, that data storage platform um, needed some additional software uh, and some services around it. And so we started working on that. Um, as it turned out, the problem on that particular niche storage platform uh, also seemed to be a much larger problem in the market. Uh, yet the, the, the software had not been built for that. There'd been no market created for that. So one thing led to another, really, uh, as, it, as it turns out. And we, we really, as I said, I mean, at some point in time, obviously, we made very conscious decisions about which direction we were going to go. Uh, but like an old friend of mine always says, you do what's in your path. And uh, so we did, and that's why we created a, a market where there wasn't one. I think the other reason was is we realised that certainly in our market sector, uh, the data storage sector, there's some very large players in that market. And in order to come out with a product that was uh, competing with them, so already in an established market, it was going to require very, very deep pockets. Uh, and we didn't have those deep pockets. And again, we made a conscious decision that um, we wanted to build a company uh, without too much external funding, or really without external funding uh, at, at that point in time, simply because we, we didn't want the pressure of venture capital, right? We wanted to be able to understand and be able to guide our own way through, uh, through the market without too many people telling us what to do and you know having too many vested interests in there so that's kind of really how that came about all right and so now that you have gone through the whole process uh and i think maybe not only once what's your kind of playbook that you use when you're launching a new product yeah it's a good question um Again, we, we didn't really have a playbook when we started, but we certainly developed one as we went along. Um, and coincidentally, many years after we started the company and were already successful, we went back and looked at the Crossing the Chasm uh, book, which we reread, uh, and we'd read it 10 years ago. Uh, we'd, we reread and realized that actually we'd followed that strategy pretty closely. Uh, uh, maybe subconsciously, uh, but we did it pretty closely. Um, and I think that that's a really, for us, a really good guidance. It's really about developing or launching new, new high-tech B2B uh, products. So we use that uh, quite extensively. Obviously, you know, it's, not, uh, it's not a Bible, but it's, it's a pretty good guide. Uh, we obviously use a lot of uh, other um, information we've picked up on the way, uh, certainly our own experience, uh, those of people around us. Uh, we certainly have uh, looked at a lot of uh, marketing sites and blog, <laughs> blogs over the years, for sure, um, that helped us, uh, helped us on our way. 
Um, launching uh, new software products as a Belgian company into, into the US market comes, of course, with its own challenges. We're not Silicon Valley based, uh, which puts, well, it, I won't say it puts you at a disadvantage, but it, 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 it's a different approach. You have to take a different approach in many ways because uh, you are not really culturally the same as a Silicon Valley company. Um, even if you have substantial funding, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be doing it in exactly the same way. So I think really you, you take whatever input you can get and you, uh, and you develop that as you go along and you learn a lot. I mean, we learn a huge amount uh, uh, even 11 years now since we started, I, I still learn uh, stuff every day about, about the market, about the partners, about our customers, uh, and continue to learn and continue to tweak our strategy as we go along. And we've got a new product launch uh, next year. Well, we've already started, but uh, the, uh, the full launch is uh, the first half of next year. And again, we're, we're learning a lot about that strategy. Now, I, I wonder when you're creating a new category there's a lot of education that needs to do right because people are not aware i really like something you mentioned earlier to me saying you know you're selling new software people are not aware of they're not gonna want to spend money on you right so i wonder like how do you go from there them not knowing uh not having the budget for that because it doesn't exist yet to them actually parting way with their hard-earned cash? Yeah. Um, the, the initial strategy for us is very much uh, finding the customers who have the real burning pain now, because the, the, the stronger the pain, the more chance you've got uh, of uh, being able to sell a product into that, into that customer, that's for sure. So now when, when you start something like we did, where there wasn't an existing market already, uh, those customers are not necessarily uh, uh, flocking to you, right? So you have to really do a lot of uh, legwork in order to find those customers. Uh, but as the market grows, you do a lot of education, of course. Now, if a customer doesn't necessarily have a budget this year, but they really like what you have, then for sure they're going to go and find that budget next year because they want to avoid that pain, even if they can't afford uh, to buy the product now. So it really is a lot of education, but also finding where the money is. Because of course, if you don't have uh, you know, massive amounts of venture capital, which you can waste, and that's how we look at it, by the way, we look at <laughs> that a lot of VC money is wasted, not spent wisely. Uh, if you don't have a lot of that, um, then you, uh, uh, education is very expensive to do. Educating the market is very expensive. So you have to find the money. You have to pay the bills. It's as simple as that. And the way to pay the bills is find the customers with the, 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 the biggest pain and then be able to sell something to them whilst continuing to educate uh, the broader market. And how do you find them? Well, so we very much do that with partners. Okay. Um, we've been, I think, uh, quite lucky uh, in our development with partners. Uh, in our market, it's, uh, it's storage vendors. Um, we have been able to work with uh, the storage vendors to be able to identify the customers uh, very quickly that have uh, the specific pain mm -hmm. and be able to, um, oh, sorry, but I just realised that I haven't a certain point so we work very much with partners in our business and that's that's data storage uh, companies now in our business they really know where the customers are who have the pain because they hear about the pain on a daily basis so we we've been lucky to work with uh, them in order to be able to identify those customers uh, who have that pain and also who um uh, who, who may not have the pain immediately now, but you know we can educate in order to be able to, uh, next time they want to do something, next time they want to uh, uh, do a project, a data migration project, then they know who to call around that. So that's the first thing. 
Um, and I think that, you know, if I go back to the Crossing the Chasm book, creating the whole product is extremely important. Creating a piece of software, as we have had done, is not just, is not enough. It doesn't answer the question. It doesn't give the, 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 the entire uh, solution that customers are looking for. You need to partner with people, other companies, in order to provide them. For us, that was certainly data storage companies. They could help provide services. Uh, they could help provide support and that kind of thing as well uh, around uh, our particular uh, market. And then um, there is also the broader channel. Uh, so what we call the channel, so value-added reservices, uh, value-added resellers, uh, service companies, and so on. Uh, they also do a lot of business in our market. So uh, they also see customers uh, with pain as well. So that's really for us what we're focused on. Okay, so you said you were lucky to have partners, and I know a lot of companies have uh, been speaking to them, and, and they dream of developing the channel partners, and they basically see this as some sort of a magic wand. Okay, I'll find partners, they'll sell for me. But what's the reality of that? In... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the reality is you've got to uh, find the right partner, and... You can, you can cast the net wide, uh, and some people do that, and I think some people probably do that as a successful uh, strategy. We didn't. We focused uh, very much. Um, in a way, uh, our partners are actually like our customers. They also have a pain. So if you find a partner that is feeling the same pain as the customer, then you're going to have a good partner because they also have a solution uh, to uh, a problem to solve and they are feeling the pain of their customers. So that for us uh, really indicates uh, a very good partner. So we focused on a few very key partners to, uh, as they say in the book, get us across the chasm. And, now, uh, okay, you, you're focusing and uh, working with a few partners, but at the same time, I'm sure they're not only selling your solution. And so maybe you're not in the market competing um, with other with all the other possible solutions, but you're kind of competing within their portfolio, right? They will have, they will be able to offer other products. So how do you come up as a top option there for them to consider selling you instead of maybe other products? Yeah, so again, I think if, if you look at the kind of partners that we initially went to market with, those partners have other products, but we really fixed a very specific problem and mm -hmm. challenge that they and their customers had. And so we didn't compete with any other products in their portfolio. Uh, and in fact, we just helped them sell more of what they normally sell. Uh, again, that's very specific kind of partners. The broader channel, you're absolutely right. In the broader channel, uh, there is hundreds of vendors uh, like us trying to get attention uh, in the broader channel. And that is certainly uh, a big challenge for any startup, uh, any small company trying to get the attention of uh, really most, mark, uh, most channel partners. Um, I think focusing on the right size of partner is extremely important there. Going after the very large value-added resellers uh, is probably not the best strategy unless you have some real magic bullet, uh, which sometimes people do. Um, the choosing partners that uh, see you as a, uh, as a real potential uh, value add rather than just another thing in their portfolio, uh, I think is extremely important. Of course, I can't speak to markets beyond my own, but uh, the that I think that that having um, salespeople, especially in complex sales, salespeople in those channel partners who understand complex selling, uh, because if you if you have a complex uh, technology solution like we do uh, that solves a, a, a really ingrained problem, uh, then you need partners who are able to speak for you uh, uh, to customers and present the value uh, to customers. So a good educated sales force, I think, is extremely important. And then, of course, there's all the classics, uh, like you have to provide 
uh, you know, good margin for them. They, they need to make money, right? And uh, they're all based around margin, so they really need to provide good margin. But in the end, the margin, although it sounds a bit strange, the margin is a little bit secondary because if you can't get their attention in the first place uh, because you're really solving a pain, uh, then the margin's are irre irrelevant because they can't sell you. So basically, you have two kinds of partners. You have your like strategic go-to-market partners, and then the value-added resellers are kind of a scale that you're getting into later. But you first want to focus on the few. Now, I wonder, like, just like practically, imagine that I have a software product and I want to go to the market with partners. Now, how do I find the, how do they go about finding the, the the few? Like, how do I qualify them that they are the right ones and obviously there is a difference between what they say at the beginning during our initial conversation uh, conversations and how they will actually behave later so how do you go from zero to having a few really good partners that you can uh, go to market with well i think it all comes down to uh, the, the 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 proof is in the eating of the pudding so if you've got partners who are actually positioning you with customers, that's <laughs> that's an immediate uh, indication that they're going to be a good partner because indeed you can spend a lot of time talking to people and, and, and getting very little progress. So our approach with partners is, uh, is always an initial meeting. Let's talk about what we've had, we have, see if it's of interest to them, and then let's immediately find opportunities together. Yeah. Uh, and if we don't find opportunities, then we, we have to conclude that, okay, this okay. is not a partner for us. So really it comes down to uh, the money. Let's find the money together. Because as I said, you've got to, as a small startup as we were many years ago, you've got to find those opportunities to keep the, uh, the, the money coming in. So basically like in the beginning, you're talking to potential partners and the key success factor there, are we finding an actual opportunity, qualified opportunity we can work together on, right? Absolutely. Makes, yeah. makes perfect sense. Now, that's the key success factor in terms of a partner, but the partner for you, partner strategy for you was also part of, of the bigger go-to-market strategy in creating the category. And I'm also wondering, like, when did you know that you were successful in, in creating category? Like when, when did you know, what were the main indicators that told you, okay, this strategy is actually working? How did you measure success? Um, well, apart from uh, revenue, um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, success, well, success is measured, I think, in a few different ways. Um, so, so I say apart from revenue, of course, revenue is number one, right? Uh, getting, uh, getting sales and seeing that come in with a partner. But um, I think that seeing repeat sales is extremely important uh, as well uh, in our business, but also um, seeing a focus uh, or let's say customers coming from a few uh, specific verticals. So we're a horizontal product, mm -hmm. but we sell into a number of uh, uh, verticals very strongly. Yeah. And I think seeing that uh, is very important because, of course, self-referencing in, in any business is extremely important. What I mean by that, and I'm taking that, of course, from the Crossing the Chasm, but what I mean by that is that uh, companies uh, talk to each other. Right? They may be competitors, but in our business, they talk to each other. They attend the same conferences, the same forums, and so on and so forth. And so they really do self-reference and they move about. Right? There's a lot of mobility uh, in, in business. So they move about. Uh, so that was really important for us to see that uh, consistent business coming from uh, the same uh, verticals. But if I, come, if I come back to partners, of course, it's it's repeat business from partners, right? So if we, if we see a partner coming, not just with one or two projects or opportunities every now and then, but coming consistently every month with new opportunities, that was a big measure of success. And then we focus on those. Uh, we focus on uh, more education, uh, more marketing spend with them uh, and so on. If they're willing also to put uh, their money uh, on the table in order to do marketing, uh, joint marketing, that 
is also another big indication that they see uh, the potential of the market. Now, you, you mentioned that repeat business, obviously revenue, especially repeat business with the partner is a great indication of success of your partner strategy. And then in terms of category creation, that for you, it was also very important to focus on a specific verticals, although it's a horizontal solution. I, I totally agree with that. That's uh, such a big missed opportunity, I believe, with a lot of companies when they don't really have that. Now... What at what what point and was that important for you? And what point did you start seeing competitors, other companies providing a similar solution like yours? So there were a couple a couple of companies um, providing uh, kind of solutions when we came into the market. Um, the market had not been built or developed yet, so they hadn't managed to do that. Uh, as we grew the market and became successful, probably. Uh, once we crossed that chasm and were really rolling on, I think that's when people started to realise there was yeah. opportunity there. Uh, most of them were very um, opportunistic, right? So yeah. a customer would say, yeah, okay, you do that, but can you do this as well? Yeah. And they'd often say, yes, of course, because, you know, like all companies, they want money, right? They need revenue. So they'd say, yes, they could, and, and, and then start to, you know, try and provide solutions around that. So I think once we crossed that chasm, we were certainly uh, knocking down the bowling pins again. People don't understand what I'm talking about. They need to read the book. Um, but I think it was really when that happened that we started to see increasing number of uh, competitors come into that space. Uh, we're certainly considered the gold standard in the space. And, and, you know, competition's great. I mean, it's just fantastic. Uh, I, I mean, I used, to, I used to hate it. I think when I first started the business uh, all those times ago, I, I didn't like competition because, of course, it takes immediate money away from you. But once you've created um, a, a, a market, you are then swimming in a much, much bigger pond. And there's certainly enough to go around. And that's, that's when you get competition. And, and to see that competition is really the indication that you've actually created a market. Uh, and that, when we saw that, it was, you know, we threw our hats up in the air and jumped for joy because we thought, yep, the market's created and here we are. And then it becomes a question for customers, not do I need a solution, it's which solution do I need? And that's really where uh, we got to. And that was a fantastic uh, feeling once we realised that. And then, of course, once we've got that, then we're able to, and that's what we're doing now and have been for the last few years, is you're starting to create new products and bring those new products uh, into an existing market. So basically having competitors is another great indicator that your market has been created. And if you've done your job right, you have a really high chance of being positioned as the golden standard, as the, let's say, the number one, the go-to solution in that market because you were the one who was creating that. Um, although sometimes what happens, of course, is that uh, you have just done all the education and somebody else might come and, 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 and take the, the cream from the top. Now, uh, you mentioned as well that you went to the U.S., that most of your business is in the U.S. And I wonder, was that intentional? Was that like that from the start? How did you get there? Yeah, that was really intentional for okay. us. Um, we knew the U.S. was a big market. Uh, when we started the company, we'd all had international experience of some, some description, right? We're a Belgian-based company, but we'd all, uh, you know, seen where the market is, seen where it evolved. We'd all been travelling in our previous company uh, to the US on a regular basis. So uh, for us, it was obvious. We needed to be in the US. Uh, we needed to um, uh, take what essentially is probably 70%. Uh, of the global market. Um, we did that by getting on planes, right? And we, we went over there on a very regular basis, uh, visiting our partners and visiting customers. So there was a lot of traveling involved. Um, that's not sustainable over a long period of time. It's not sustainable from uh, uh, either a physical cost or 
uh, a footprint um, perspective either, right? We all have to be extremely careful. So uh, we started hiring fairly early on uh, in, in the US uh, and built the team uh, over there. Uh, so half of our team, uh, about half of our team now is uh, in the US and uh, the other half in Europe and some in, uh, in uh, Asia Pacific. And what's the focus of the US team? What is, is that a sales team predominantly or? Pre predominantly sales, marketing and support. As okay, well. so, so all the customer models. facing functions make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so you did it very intentionally. And again, I know a lot of European companies who kind of have a dream of growing in the US. And do you think that's always a good idea? Uh, I, I'm, I, I honestly, I can't, it's difficult to answer that question because I don't, I think everybody's, every company is different. Every market's different. Um, I think that it really depends on uh, the, uh, the products you have. It depends on your funding. I think it depends on your personal preferences. Um, there are companies, of course, who start off in Europe and very quickly go and uh, move to Silicon Valley. Uh, because that's where they can really attract funding and that's fair enough. Um, it is more difficult, I think, to attract the high tech funding here in Europe. Well, I'm sure it's available. Uh, so that's, that's one reason. So I wouldn't, uh, I, I could not say whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, Vlad. Um, I just know the way we did it. Uh, it certainly worked for us to be established here, but get an office over there quickly and build staff that we could trust uh, over there uh, very quickly. But we didn't move there, right? We kept our engineering and our headquarters uh, here in Belgium and, and we're very happy we did that. But uh, we were able to straddle the Atlantic uh, quite nicely. And uh, the reason that I asked this question is because obviously like it's a bigger opportunity, but it's also bigger competition for a lot of companies who are maybe not like you, being there for kind of market creation, having the right partners, uh, and on the other, in the in other words, there is a huge competition. And do you feel that European companies, when there is a big competition, can be per, can be disadvantaged, can be perceived somehow differently by the U.S. customers? Um, U.S. customers are pretty smart and they're also um, very what I would call quite multicultural because you look at a US company and there's yeah. many 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 different cultures working in those companies and I, I think that that is pretty normal yeah, in the US and uh, that that's quite nice in a way uh, I think it's actually easier for a European company to set up in the US than it is the other way around because we know how fragmented culturally uh, Europe is, right? I mean, a lot of companies start out by setting up in the UK, uh, which of course culturally is quite different to you know, Belgium or France or, or Germany uh, and so on. So I think it's, it's really, uh, I won't say easy, but I think there's a lot more, it, it can be a lot more simple if you set up an office, uh, as we did, for instance, in New York, uh, uh, to then you know go out to the rest of uh, the, the the country, and and of course, it, of course, it's not the rest of the country, right? You you're, you you tend to spread out in a fairly you know easy way or or, or more sim simple way along the east coast of, uh, of the United States or potentially the west, depending on what your product is. So, I think. For us, that was culturally a fairly straightforward process. Again, you know, we'd been working over there, so we, we understood the culture reasonably well. But, you know, the US, most people in the US make it, make it very accessible uh, to do business there because they want to do business. It's as simple as that. They want to do business uh, and they understand that people come from all over the place, uh, all different corners of uh, the country and the planet in order to be able to do business. And that's just really normal. All right. So um, very encouraging <laughs> for, yeah, for a lot of people. Yeah. Now, 
I, I wonder you because the last time we spoke, you mentioned that, uh, and I really like that, that the main goal of marketing is making it easy for your customer to buy. And when you're creating a buyer experience like that, so what do you focus on? Like, what are some of the main friction points that you're trying to remove? Yeah, so it, it a, lot, a lot depends on, on who you're uh, selling to or who, who's buying from you. Um, I think that if I think about our customers, they're all busy, right? They're all, all incredibly busy. Um, expanding data, uh, reduced budgets, um, complex environments and so on. So they're all busy and they're all... Uh, trying to come to terms with all the, the, the challenges and the threats uh, that are there for them. So not taking up much of their time is uh, extremely important because they really do not have much time. Uh, they don't have time to sit around and, and, and chew the fat on theoretically nice ideas, right? They really want a solution to a very specific pain. So I think uh, making sure that you are really talking to them about a pain that they really have and really have now makes it easy for them. Uh, most of the time, we can sell even a large uh, uh, um, deal in a one-hour conversation because we show them our software. At the end of it, they say, okay, we get this. We understand this fixes it. No problems. And then, of course, comes the next step is let's find the money. And when you're building a new market, that's often the next difficult step. How do we find the money? And I think that's where uh, you need to really get uh, help from your partners because your partners have a lot of experience in helping those customers find budget. And budget can come from many different ways. And if, it, if it, the budget is not necessarily there this year in a, in a new market, it can be there next year if the customer understands you. And then, of course, making sure the customer continues to remember that you are a solution. So next time they are um, budgeting, they will put you uh, in that budget because they see the solution as being necessary. So I think they're the main friction points that a, uh, that a customer has. Um, I'm not arrogant enough to know or to, to, to say exactly how every customer we have is feeling uh, about or, or, or what they're dealing with, but I think I've got a pretty good idea uh, at the high level that those are the kinds of issues that they uh, need to solve in order to be able to buy you. And the quicker you can solve those for them, the quicker they can buy. All right. And... Uh... Just looking back at the whole 11 year journey, and if you had to do it again, are there any things that you would have done differently? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, that's, a, that's, that's a question that is uh, quite difficult to answer. It's the, uh, the blue or the red pill question. And I think that um, there, are, there are probably some things uh, we may, uh, knowing what we know now, because hindsight's uh, you know perfect, right? So knowing what we know now, there are probably phases we would have gone faster. Um, we probably would have uh, increased uh, or, or brought uh, PR into uh, the company a lot earlier than we did. We waited quite a long time to uh, to uh, bring a PR firm. Uh, in when we did, we were very happy we did, but uh, so that's probably something we would do. So there's probably a few phases that we might make go faster. But again, if I look back, I think you the the to some extent creating a new market like this is organic, and organic means it has its own life, and you can't necessarily um, enforce a uh, too much of an artificial process on top of that. There are things you can do for sure, tweaks and so on, um, but it really does have its own life and you have to kind of push where you can, but you have to go with, uh, with uh, how it evolves naturally. All right. 
I think this is a great way to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Michael. This was, uh, I think, super interesting for everybody who is considering new markets selling into the US, uh, especially complex sales and working with partners. Thank you so much. Where, just if you can just let us know if people want to connect to you, learn more about you and, and the company you're running, where, where they can best find you. Absolutely. Datadobe.com. Simplest place to go and uh, they'll find everything they need to know about us there. Cool. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks, Vlad. Appreciate the time.